I just love, I just love when a plan comes together. And uh, I'd ask you to join with me as you, uh, as we are praying that we're not just here to check off the boxes that we've been in church, but we're here to make sure we hear from God. Uh, I have a little bit of, I have a public, uh, public interest announcement. So um, we are grateful. We took, we gave away all of our hundred plus shoe boxes and they need to be in here next, next Sunday. If you bring it on Monday, it's too late. And so just so you'll know that, uh, that, that for, that's what it's going to get to for, for here. And that means you will then have to personally take it to the, the other depot. And there's also, a, this is a really bad way of saying it, but there's a drop dead date for that too. If you miss that other drop off, then you have to either hold your, your box for next year, which would really be sad, or you have to ship it yourself to, to, to Calgary. So uh, if you have a box, you need to make sure it's back by when? Next Sunday. Next Sunday. And if you don't get it here on Sunday, what happens? You have to go to, I think it's usually the Surrey Alliance Church. And if you miss that, then you have to pay personally to get it to Calgary. So you don't want to do that, right? Good. All right. Awesome. Um, one other thing, I'm just weighing in on this from a, from a pastoral point of view. Every year, if you're new with us, we have developed this giving tree. And basically, we are looking for, for people who are in need. Um, and we we get the, we collect those needs, and Teresa makes these lovely uh, little ornaments that go on the giving tree that's here, and people take it usually for the time when we have the community in for the kids' presentation. And um, we don't always know of people's needs, but you might. And, if, and it doesn't have to be somebody in our church, but it, somebody in your neighborhood or somebody at your workspace. And usually we ask for something that's like, you know, 15 to $25 and, you know, you can take that off and it's given anonymously. But I also want to say too, we don't always know what's going on in your life. And maybe you're, maybe you're in a situation this year where you could really use some help to, for your kids or for yourself. And if you just anonymously write those names down and give it to one of the pastoral staff. Because, you know, the reality is we want to we wanna meet people's needs in Jesus' name. So public announcement number two, I'm done. Let's pray. Jesus, um, this season has been real meaningful to me. Lord, that <clears throat> I've turned a really important corner where some of these concepts I've known for a really long time, but because I'm living through them, Lord, there's just a weight. And so, Lord, I'm preaching to myself this morning. I'm proclaiming your truth to myself this morning. And, Lord, I would pray that you would help us to have ears to hear what you would say to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, would you turn with me uh, to uh, John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8? And I want to read it, and then we're going to, we're going to um, dissect it, as it were. Hey, thanks. Yeah, th these are the red seats up here. They're front row. Oh, that's good. So here's what Jesus said. He said, starting with verse 1, he said, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Uh, I really like that section. That, never mind. <laughs> he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does not bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and if my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Pruning. Now, as I was going through this, uh, if you, I, I like, I have, if you're not part of the Force, the Sunshine Hills Facebook group, uh, I try to make sure I. I post something. And today I told a story. I remember this like yesterday is one of my most vivid memories of my earthly father. 
um, we had this little grapevine that was on the, the property line between us and, and Cal Domer next door. And so again, I never paid much attention to it except in the fall when I would go and I would uh, eat grapes right off the vine. So one, one spring, my dad being the man he was, he said, Tommy, he says, come with me, I wanna show you something. So I traipsed along and, and he said, see this? He said, see how overgrown it is? And he says, now watch. And he began to, to cut away all of the excess. And I thought for sure he killed it. And I said, Dad, there's nothing left. And he says, no, there is. He says, you watch that this will cause new growth and we will have more grapes at the end of this season than we've had in the previous year because I've done what's called pruning. So I want to say that there's this illusion of the status quo. And, you know, I grew up in a little town and, and everything just stayed the same way. And I, Lottie and I were back there in 2011 and, and uh, almost everything was just as I had left it. 35 years ago. And the problem is I have this rural mindset. And a rural mindset says once something's in place, it always stays in place. But if you grew up in the city, you have an urban mindset. And so when a building is no longer useful and it has been written off, those of you who are accountants, you know that it, like, it doesn't make sense to this non-accountants where they'll say, well, that building has no value. You know, just you can tear it down and it doesn't quote, cost anything. And I'm saying, that doesn't make sense. I get it. I do. But we have this illusion of the status quo. But I want to just declare to you that nothing is static. We live in a dynamic world. We live in a dynamic universe that's changing. And, and, and again, there's the law of entropy, which is one of the strongest arguments to me against evolution is that, that one of the, the law of entropy and one of um, Sir Isaac Newton's rules of, of physics is, is that the world is winding down and evolution says it's winding up or things are changing. The reality is, is that it's deteriorating. So we just have to realize that we like the status quo, at least most of us do, maybe I do. <laughs> I like it when I, I get up and everything's the same. Lottie will attest to this, and it was it was it was um, it was bad b before my heart surgery. It's even worse now that there's so few things that I have, and so I go to a restaurant and I like, especially for breakfast, I order pancakes. I look at the sausage and I drool, but I can't eat it. I, you know, I I look at the bacon, and and in four years I think I've maybe had like ten pieces of real bacon, and not even well. I, I wanted to make sure I wasn't underestimating. You know, and and um, you know, and and you you look at it, and we go to the men's breakfast, and there's this, you know, sometimes there's this big pile of bacon, and but again, it's just not going to go there. It doesn't have any pull on me. But there's this illusion; things change, and I like things to be the same, and I like to be able to say, "Yes, it's going to be there tomorrow." But the reality is, is that this parable of Jesus or this story of Jesus tells us that that things are dynamic and that the status quo will actually work against fruitfulness in our lives. And, you know, yeah, yeah, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. So I want to look at the, the players here. So uh, we have the vine. The vine is Jesus. We have the branches, that's you and me. And, and again, uh, those of you who, when a few of you came through the 70s as, as believers, but we had this really silly song which we sang here. And it says, I am, the, you know, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And his, you know, banner over me is love. And we was, oh, he, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And it was just ridiculous. But it was the 70s and the 80s, so you can forgive that. You, have you seen their clothes? Oh, no, I'm sorry, they're coming back. Anyways, we're the branches. And the gardener is God the Father. And just like my earthly dad drug me out to the, to the back 40, no, it was just the backyard, and says, I want to show you something that my dad knew something I didn't. He had a perspective that I didn't have. And so the gardener, the father, you know, not Victor Gardner, but God the father, that he knows something we don't know. And he has a purpose. 
And then we have the fruit. And it says that not only are we to bear fruit, but we're to bear much fruit and fruit that remains. And so one of the things I've been praying in this season where God has really been working on creating more humility in my life, and I'm one of those people who would never say, Lord, keep me humble. That presupposes that I am humble. <laughs> when, I, when somebody, you know, what I'll say is, is I, I say, Lord, help me be humble, for I am very proud. But one of the things that I've been doing more, more intentionally is that following a service, I pray all week long. I'm saying, God, help us all remember that we're not God. This week is going to be, Lord, help us to remember that you are not hacking away at our vine or our branches, but you are, you are, serotip, you are just with great purpose and knowledge and understanding. You're pruning away things that though green and have life are actually taking away from the very thing that you desire, which is fruitfulness, and fruit that not just is here and it's gone, but the fruit that remains. Now, again, I'm a person who likes results. And, you know, when I became a pastor, one of the greatest shifts in my life was that up until I got into ministry, I would put in a certain amount of work and I would get a, a known result. You know, you do the homework, you get an A. You do this, you get this. Uh, I drove a forklift for five years at Simpson Sears in the warehouse, and I could, at the end of the day, I could measure how many orders I, I had picked. It was measurable. But this is different. How does one put a premium on a conversation, a cup of coffee with someone, a service, a prayer? And th this is where I rest, where it says, apart from me, you can do nothing, that Jesus is the one that's producing fruit. But I am praying and I'm asking you to pray. Say, God, just help whatever was shared, regardless of whether it's me or Danny or Danny or Lottie or whomever. Lord, let that be worked out in my life. Let it not just be a little flash in the pan. Now, the other thing is, is that there's seasons in our life. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 I do like fall. I, I like the fact that it's harvest season and harvest season is wonderful because when you're doing the harvest, it's easy to be able to see all the hard work that went in and, and clearing the land and planting and cultivating and all of those things. But growing up in an agricultural community, my best friend growing up was, his dad was a dairy farmer and he would plant stuff. And so, you know, all I know is that there came a point where he did the work in the spring but there was a whole block between spring and harvest where there were things that were totally and completely out of his control. Totally. He couldn't will there to be rain. He couldn't will the sun to come up. All of those things. And so all I know is that God has seasons in our life. So there's, there's the season of, of, of being dormant and there's the spring and then there's the summer hot sun that brings forth life and then there's the harvest. I wish I could live in harvest all the time. Don't you? I do. I wish, man, that, man, every time I turn, oh, yeah, there's my bumper crop. Oh, man, my barns are full. Oh, yeah, things are just going great. But I just know that I have to recognize the fact that there are seasons, and I need to be faithful in every season so that we can have harvest. Now, there's truths about pruning, and I was really proud of this. You know, this is, I'm not this smart. I thought the Lord gave this to me, but there's three Ps here of pruning, pruning. There's the paradox of pruning. The paradox is a truth that looks contradictory and yet is true. And so the paradox is that less is more. God is not measuring fruitfulness by how much fluff and how much extra detritus there is and how many leaves there's on the tree. But at the end of the day, the paradox is less is more that you have to cut to produce fruit. You've got to prune 
to produce life. And pruning often looks like death. I mean, let me tell you, when my dad went after that grapevine in the 1960s, early 1960s, oh my goodness, I thought for sure it was dead. But it had within it life. And instead of all of the nutrients or whatever going to all of this extra stuff, it produced fruit. It's painful. But God, I really like that part of me. Don't cut that. Oh, it hurts. You know, I remember my dad when he was disciplining me and my girls for me say, this, this is going to hurt you more than it, than, it, than it hurts you. And I never got that until I was a parent. And I came to the realization that if, if when I discipline the children or the grandkids, if it doesn't cost me something, I'm not doing it right. Pruning is painful. And if you haven't felt the pain of spiritual pruning, you will. If you say, God, just what we sang, Lord, I lay myself down. I surrender, I surrender. I want to know you more. Paul writes in, in first in the Philippians chapter three, he says, he says this, he says, that I might know you in the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. We love, we love the power of his resurrection. Oh, wow. Man, we're going to just do this and this and this and this and this. But to know the power of his resurrection, we must experience the fellowship of his suffering. Ouch. I really like that. But the Lord says, it's sapping strength from what I want to do in your life. Wayne Cordero, God used a four square guy in Hawaii. And he told the story. Some of you heard me tell this, but it's a good story. I'm going to tell it again. He liked bonsai. You know, that's where they take these, these old, old, old trees and they keep them miniature. And, and uh, so anyways, he signed up, spent a lot of money to, to, to go. There was this world-renowned botanist and horticulturist that he was talking about pruning. And so they all came and they sat in the theater at the University of Hawaii, I guess it was. And they were watching and they, they brought in this big plant. And so here's what the guy did. For the first, it was a two-hour seminar. And for the first hour, the guy said nothing. He just walked around. Hmm. And so... Wayne says, you know, first 10 minutes, well, you know, okay. yeah, we get what you're doing. And, and then, you know, it was 20 minutes. And then by the time 45 minutes came around, he was thinking to myself, I spent that much money for this? And finally, after an hour, the guy took his, 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 his pruning instrument and in about five minutes, he just began to cut and whatever. And all of a sudden, this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful plant emerged from all of this. And the reality is that he, this guy said, what do you think I was doing for that whole hour? I was looking for the natural strength of that tree or that plant. And I began to see things that were impeding that and I removed whatever wasn't part of the, 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 the strength and the beauty of that plant and now you see the result. We need the gardener. Pruning is the proof of fruitfulness. There's another P, lots of P's. It's the proof of fruitfulness. Jesus said every branch that bears fruit he prunes so that it can bear more fruit but there's a gap between the pruning and the harvest and it takes faith and trust in the midst of the pruning to trust God for the harvest unfruitful branches are removed I'm not going that's a whole other sermon but the goal of the exercise the goal of the exercise is to produce fruit, to produce more fruit. 
to produce fruit that remains. God's not interested in just having your life have fruit. He wants more fruit. And it's not because he's greedy, but it's because we are created to be his fellow laborers. He has invited us in to the process of seeing lives being changed and transformed. And at the end of the day, I wouldn't trade a church of 10,000 for a church that was seeing lives changed. Are you following me? Fruitfulness isn't measured by how many people sit in a place or how much money comes in. But I would suggest to you how many people are sitting in a place and how much money comes in is a direct result of spiritual fruitfulness. It's not the measure, it's the result. Now, our lives become overgrown. So Wayne Cordero, when he was talking about this, he, he, he got very busy. And you know, if you're an industrious person, it's easy to be busy. So people will say, they'll call me up, are you busy? I says, no, I'm sitting here just waiting for you to call. No, I don't. That goes through my mind sometimes. Um, but, you know, when I, I'm thinking, and it says, I'll, I'll usually say something like this. You know, I'm, I've always got something to do, but I'm not too busy to talk to you. What, would you. what can I do for you? But my life becomes overgrown, and so does yours. So here's the application. I'm not going to judge you. I don't want you judging me. What might look like it's overgrown in my life may be what God is doing in me, but it doesn't look like that for you. And that's the challenge here is where we have to be so careful to say, he's too busy or he should be doing this or she shouldn't be doing this. I don't remember reading that any of, any of us are called to be the ones who do the pruning. I think I read that was the father's part. But I would say this. We were talking about this yesterday. We had a great men's breakfast. And said we asked the question is, when you ask the question, how are you? And the new answer to, I'm, instead of saying I'm fine, is I'm so busy. <laughs> and we kind of walked away through that. We had a great conversation yesterday. My question is, we are called to be busy for the work of the master. But the question is, are you busy? Am I busy doing the right things? Am I busy or am I focused on what God wants to do in and through me? And that takes some reflection. And so here's, here's your assignment. Here's your homework. Is I'm asking you to prayerfully consider this. I want you to think about this. Look at this passage of scripture. And I want to challenge you because I'm doing this right now is I want to you will start walking around your life and saying, things represent my life getting overgrown and are taking away from the natural strength and the calling that I'm asked to do. So do it or not, but at least I put it out there for you. Jesus said, abide in me, stay with me, continue with me, dwell with me, endure with me, remain with me, stand with me. And you know, sometimes... You know, I don't know, I, I'm far more melancholy than most people know. You know, sometimes people think that, <laughs> she's laughing, because she lives with me. Sometimes people think I'm just bulletproof, and I can just handle the world, and I want you to know I can't. But you know what? One of the things I can do is I can be faithful. I talked about this last week. I can be faithful, and I can be obedient, and I can do what God's asking me to do. I can do that. And sometimes success is just you're still standing. You're still abiding. Though he slay me, Job wrote, yet yeah, will I trust in him. I'm going to stand. I'm going to abide. 
When difficult times come, I don't shake my fist, although if you do, God understands because he knows your heart. But I say, okay, God, I understand. Why are you doing this? Why is that hurt so much? Why is the cut seem so deep? Why do I feel so alone? Why do I feel so misunderstood? Why do I feel so defeated? Why do I feel all of those things? Maybe you don't go through all of, those, all of that rages inside of me from time to time. But at the end of the day, and having done all to stand, abide. The role of the gardener, why does he prune us? Because he loves us. How does he prune us? Only he knows. I don't always understand. The Bible says God's ways are higher than our ways. And boy, there's some places on my branch I really like to protect. I really like that one, God. And God said, nope, sorry, son, it's in the way. Oh! I'll tell you what, I've lived long enough to thank God for some of the deep prunes in my life. You've heard me say this. Hasn't been the easiest of seasons for me personally. But I want you to know that I've turned a corner and this, I've just said, God, just do whatever you need to do. It belongs to you. My life belongs to you. My time belongs to you. This church belongs to you. It isn't mine. I'm going to trust you. Just do whatever you got to do because at the end of the day, I want to be fruitful. How does he do it? What does God prune? It looks as individual as each one of us. And finally, what's going to be our response? Will we trust the Father that he knows best? And I leave you with this question. Are you willing to go beyond submission to cooperation? See, there's, there's a very, and, I, and if the worship team, if they, they're ready to start coming up here and getting ready. There's a huge difference between sub, sub, submitting and cooperating. I want to say that again. There's a huge difference between saying, okay, God, do it to me, but I'm not happy about it. And cooperation, which says, okay, God, I surrender. Jesus, would you make this real as we turn the corner to go into communion in Jesus' name? Communion, would you just come up? We're going to just kind of work together with the worship team. Would you come up? Jesus, on the same night in which you betrayed, you took the bread and you broke it and you said, this is my body which is broken for you. Lord, we thank you that you love us more than we can ever understand and that you're working both to will and to do for your good pleasure. So Lord, we want to submit and we want to cooperate. So Lord, as we partake together of this representation, Lord, that the that the, the bread represents your brokenness, the, the cup represents your lifeblood that was shed for us. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that you make yourself real in Jesus' name. Now, if you're new with us this morning, you don't have to be a member of our church to participate. You're here, you share with us as we partake together of this life-giving message of the restoration and wholeness of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray now your blessing upon the bread. Bless it, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've gone something different. Hold on to your portion. We're going to do it together. If, you're, if you need a gluten-free, there's some in the little doorly there. Let's just allow Jesus to, to work in us, okay? There is a light that burns brighter than the sun. He steals the night. Cast no shadow, there is hope. Should oceans rise and mountains fall, he never fails. So 
As you hold your portion of loft, I want to just pour, poise right there. Father, we just speak hope. Lord, in the midst of what you're doing, when we don't understand, we speak hope that you care for us, that you love us. And so, Lord, because you died for us, because you live for us, take now, let's eat it, let's do it together. In Jesus' name. So, Lord, we lift our ourselves to you, Lord, and we thank you for this cup that represents our freedom. And Lord, we're going to say, God, that your life courses through us to bear much fruit that remains in Jesus' name. And now we're going to ask you as the cup goes by, please take, drink it, and put it back in the tray if you would, and we'll just continue to keep singing. All our troubles and all our tears, God our hope, He has overcome all our failure and all our fear, God our love, He has overcome all
So in closing, would you just close your eyes again? If you're new with us, we want to welcome you. But I want to do this every time we meet. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't really kind of understand all that went on, but you just know that maybe your heart's pounding, maybe it's not, but you're here because you were at least investigating hope and faith. And everybody's got their eyes closed. I've only asked our elders to just keep their eyes open so I don't miss someone. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Tom, by raising my hand, I'm saying I'm inviting Jesus into my life to be my personal Savior. Is anybody like that? Anybody? But then, Lord, I just thank you that we could be together today and that you, we heard from you. Lord, just through the words of exhortation, through the songs. And oh, Lord God, we pray that we would go forward and we would submit but cooperate with the pruning that our lives would bear much fruit, that would last and remain. We ask this, we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? Again, don't remember there's stuff to sign up for and be aware of, and, and there's T-shirts. If you're looking for something to add to your, your Operation Christmas Child thing back there, right where we're, Josh was turning on the lights, there's some T-shirts. Take one, put it in your box. And also, there's people that always kind of hang out here at the front. If you need somebody to pray for you, make sure you don't walk away. If you need help, you, you, you seek it out. God bless you. Have a great day.